I'm recording in progress. So you have to turn off your uh, speaker. I said, Michael, can you want to turn off your speaker? Yeah. No, no, no. Can you, can you actually? Uh, in your computer, you have to publish. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, oh, yeah, exactly. Right? Yep. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, I will give uh, an inter uh, kind of introduction to the theory or to, to crystal bilayer and the new things we have done about superconductivity. And as there have been many talks uh, this summer on the subject, I have included some new topics, which hopefully will be of interest uh, to some of you. Uh, no, what's happening? Nice. Okay, <laughs> I go from problem to problem. I don't know why this is not working. Oh, okay, finally. Okay, you will remember how these things started, so I will not uh, delve onto that. I will just emphasize, as there are people with many backgrounds in this audience, uh, the, the connections or, or the differences between crystal bilayer graphene and other more. Uh, ostensibly study superconductors like the cuprates, the mid ties, and so on. And in many cases, as I mentioned in, in this slide, the Hubbard model has been the starting point to the study of correlations and superconductivity in these systems. Uh, uh, correlated states and superconductivity in carbon compounds were there before the experiments uh, at MIT from Pablo Javier Herrero. There were, People have found superconductivity in graph and what they, it's called graphite intercalation compounds, which you can think of as heavily doped graphene layers. People have found the thermal renormalization of the Fermi velocity due to the fact that it's a, a Dirac system, and because of that, long range uh, Coulomb interactions are not screened. And people have found correlated behavior in the quantum hole regime in graphene and, and also superconductivity in doped fully rings up to relatively high critical temperatures. But uh, that was it. Uh, uh, definitely superconductivity has never been found in graphite. I mean, there were reports, but uh, not very credible to say the least of superconductivity in graphite. They have been uh, <laughs> repeated very recently, but uh, there was no, no, no clear evidence for uh, strongly correlated behavior of superconductivity in graphite. Uh, the idea that uh, twisted by layer graphene were interesting started with uh, tight binding calculations <clears throat> in about 2010. Then, and that, uh, before that, uh, Joao Lopez dos Santos, Nuno Perez, and Antonio Castorneto had uh, made a <clears throat> generalization of the Dirac model people used to study the low energy properties of a single layer graphene to twisted graphene. It's a continuum model, a KP model. And that model in 2010 was extensively studied by Alan McDonald and Rafi Bistritzer in a famous paper in, in, in NAS, where uh, in agreement with the tight binding calculations I just mentioned, they, <coughs> they discovered that there were very flat bands at certain twist angles. and. They were so flat that even the Fermi velocity, uh, the effective Fermi velocity of these bands went all the way to zero. <clears throat> and and in, shortly later, we cooked up a, a more a simplified model where the bands were not uh, approximately flat, were infinitely flat, which is now called the chiral. 
Uh, and experimentally, uh, uh, I just mentioned it in the previous talk, uh, such features, features related to new van Gogh singularities and, and uh, such things, were already measured with, a, with an STM by uh, Ivan Ray and collaborators. Okay, the, the model itself is very interesting. I'm going to review very uh, briefly this continuum model put forward to study <coughs> the properties of twisted bilayer graphene, a small twist angle. Uh, this is a scheme of what's going on. You have the large Brillouin zones associated to the two twisted layers and the small Brillouin zones are associated to the more Larys. And what you have to know, and, and you assume that tunneling conserves momentum, tunneling from one layer to the other. And you have to notice that if you are uh, in one layer, uh, you, there are three ways in which a plane wave can tunnel into the second layer, which are not equivalent. Also, the three K points in one layer are equivalent. The way the, the plane wave, which starts in one layer, shows up in the other layer, can have it's a superposition, let me put it that, that way, of three plane waves. Then these, these three plane waves are reflected back in the, <coughs> in the first layer, and they become even more uh, uh, plane waves. And the whole thing complicates, so there are multiple interference processes. And at the end of the day, for reasons not fully understood, in my opinion, uh, you have these flat bands for certain angles. Uh, <coughs> So uh, at the end of the day, these wave functions have a lot of internal structure. And, and this is an, an interesting issue that was uh, pointed out. I'm afraid the point is not very clear in this paper. Uh, you have flat bands and typically flat bands in a strong, in, in, in a narrow band system, they are associated to highly localized atomic orbitals, let's say F orbitals in uranium or, or something like that. That is not the case, at, and then they look the same no matter where in the band you are. That's not the case in twisted by layer graphene. It happens that there is a big difference whether you are at the gamma point or at the K point of the mini Brillouin zone. The wave function of the associated uh, states are totally different. At the K point, these wave functions are uh, piled at the AA regions, as Ali mentioned before. While at the gamma point, uh, the, the wave functions are totally different. They spread out more or less uniformly over the entire uh, real space unit size. <clears throat> this is again another picture of the charge density of different points in the same flat band. And I emphasize this thing doesn't happen in a typical flat band strongly correlated system. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, and, and things become more complicated as studied by Leon Valens and others when you go beyond the first magic angle. But I will concentrate on the first magic angle in the following. <laughs> as, as I said, in, in, in other systems, the flat bands become, because they're based on highly localized uh, orbitals, which are far away from each other, and moreover, they become flatter because of interactions. They are renormalized because they, they, the electrons, uh, they, they need to drag uh, excitations of the medium and they, 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 the effective mass increases and the bands become flatter. Uh, none of these things is included in the continuum model I just outlined for you. This is a non-interacting model. All the parameters you plug in are in the scale of 100 MeV or larger. That's the interlayer tunneling and, and the <coughs> intralayer uh, hopping. And at the end of the day, you get bands whose width can be a few MEPs. That's very unusual and has no counterpart in, in a typical strongly correlated system. <clears throat> because of that, because of the complexity of the model, this is just a cartoon. We theorists have tried to analyze it from many points of view. The Hubbard-like picture will require first the knowledge of the Vanier functions, which is a quite challenging task. People have used the chiral model and extension and exploit it in order to show similarities with Landau levels, which is the other clear case of flat bands in condensed matter. And then in two dimensions, the density of states diverges that of course enhances the role of interactions. There are the Van Hoff singularities and then these Van Hoff singularities also play, <coughs> are expected to play a major role on what happens in the phase diagram. 
Uh, first, let me mention that the question of defining the, the Vanier function, something we've had to work it out, for instance, here in 3S, is, is quite more challenging than what it looks. First, because you cannot do it starting from the continuum model. The continuum model assumes that this valley is independent of the other. Uh, each valley is topological in the sense that it's like a Landau level. It has a final churn number. It has a very curvature, <coughs> which does an average to zero. And because of that, the Vanier functions you define uh, need to have a power rotates. They are not exponentially localized. <coughs> and moreover, at the end of the day, it, you can calculate them, for instance, using the divining calculations, as I mentioned. You get uh, Vanier functions, which are very unusual. They have this uh, <coughs> spinner shape, as they, they are called. They are defined in an effective honeycomb lattice uh, of the size of the Moire unit cell, but they peak not at, at their <coughs> origins, but at, at the center of the unit cell. And they seem to overlap. Vanier function by construction cannot overlap, but they are defined in the same space. Again, that's uncommon. That's not the typical Vanier function you get in other flat bands, which you can characterize very <coughs> easily in terms of uh, atomic orbitals. There's the question <coughs> of how useful these uh, lead Vanier functions are, There's the question of the abstraction. You have, as I said, if you define wave functions uh, starting from individual valleys, you have to pay the price uh, by, of, of power rotates. They're not exponentially localized. Moreover, Vanier functions, I have to warn you, they are not uniquely determined. It's, uh, you have to optimize them, but you're never sure that you are choosing the best Vanier function appropriate for the problem at hand. But nevertheless, they have a well-defined core and they are normalizable. The power of tail doesn't imply that they are not normalizable. So they are actually not that useless as some people may believe. You can take them and calculate UMCLA processes and things like that related to the more one But now let's go to the interactions. The very large size of the unit cell, this large number, 10,000 atoms in the unit cell, and allows you to characterize uh, to a first approximation the role or the relevance of the interactions. <coughs> and uh, the leading interaction is going to be the Coulomb interaction. As Ali mentioned, uh, this charge accumulation at the center of the unit cell, the, uh, even if you have a gate which uh, cancels the average charge, you still have an inhomogeneous ch charge of zero average, but which is uh, <coughs> not negligible at all, that defines for you an electrostatic self-energy, which scales like uh, the square root of the number of atoms in the unit cell, scales like the radius or like the size of the Moire unit cell. All other interactions, they scale like one over, or one <coughs> over the number of, of the area of the unit cell. So to, uh, as a first approximation, the, the, the the interaction you have to look first is the Coulomb interaction, the long range Coulomb interaction, rather than for instance in intra atomic Hubbard. Okay. <clears throat> this, uh, and now uh, let's do the simplest approximation you can imagine, which is the mean field, hard three calculations. The crucial point is that as you increase or to change the charge of the system, you are creating this accumulation of charge at the center of the unit cell. As, <coughs> as Ali also mentioned, the energy scale associated to this accumulation of charge is much larger than the bandwidth of the, of the uh, central bands themselves. So, and uh, this charge, uh, you, you create this potential, this electrostatic potential you create changes in different ways the, the, the states at gamma and at k because they have associated charge distributions which are changes from place to place. So uh, <clears throat> because of that, uh, I will show you later, you're changing uh, the, the, the not only, uh, you're not shifting, you're not only shifting the band, you're changing the shape of the band itself because uh, the states at gamma do not feel this uh, potential. They are uniformly distributed in the unit cell and this potential has zero average, while the states at K are strongly pushed up or down by this potential you create as you charge up uh, the system. And that, uh, sorry, that defines for you this change in the shape of the bands 
implies like an effective uh, interaction. If you try to define effective interactions in terms of a local picture, you have what uh, in way back uh, for the fish called uh, assisted hopping, uh, namely as the interactions change the very tight binding parameters which determine the bands, uh, the shape of the bands themselves. Uh, the, these are examples of what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, this, uh, for instance, down here, these uh, red uh, uh, bands are the bands at the neutrality point where there's no charge accumulation. But as soon as you put some charge in the system, some points of the bands are pushed up or down, depending on, on whether you're on the electron or the whole side, while the gamma point remains more or less unaltered. There is a big change. And at the end of the day, the bandwidth is controlled not by the initial model, the model I described to you earlier, but by the interactions themselves. The total bandwidth is more related to the interaction than to the initial parameters of, of the model. And then you have very complex uh, uh, <clears throat> possible Fermi energies with many pockets per value. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, even if you start with flat bands, interactions will uh, make them dispersive. So even in the Kaidak model, you have this phenomenon. And that's interesting because uh, nowhere I know, of, I mean, <clears throat> in condensed matter I know of, bands become uh, much wider because of the interactions. As I said, the typical effect of interactions is to make bands narrower, never wider. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's and interaction and the opposite effect when they become flat. In other words, if you put initial dispersive time surface, it will be compensated by what you get by the interaction. That's a, a good point. I couldn't rule out happening at other angles. At the magic angle, I think it will not be the case because it's very clear that you accumulate uh, the, the, at the magic angle by definition, the ones are flat. And, and what they do is that they go in the opposite direction, they become wider. But I agree with you that that's a question to be studied. Maybe at other angles, it will happen. I, I, I cannot rule it out. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, Ali also mentioned this nice paper <laughs> by Andre Bernevi, and uh, where they, he discusses the flat bands as, as hybrids, the hybrids of uh, itinerant electrons and, and a flat band, a kind of condolite band. And if you look at, there is like a, a flat band which is moving up and down. And then in addition, near gamma, you have dispersive bands. So, so I, I like the model actually, it, it has a point on it. And it is based on this difference between wave functions at different points of the one zone of the flat band. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, th these are other theory works which basically uh, show the same results. There's no question that this change in the shape of the bands is there. And uh, more interestingly, experimentally, this uh, uh, fact that the bands, the bandwidth is never a few MeVs, it's always larger than that, has been confirmed in many SPM experiments and also uh, in, in compressibility experiments. And this is the kind of effect I am trying to, this is a cartoon of the effect I, I was discussing before, this kind of effective hopping, which is uh, uh, induced in twisted by layer graphene. <coughs> Actually, I forgot I had, a, 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 oh yeah, um, uh, I always uh, associated assisted hopping to horse his, but my colleague, Misha Carnington, told me like that, 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 like in many other situations, uh, Russian physicists have anticipated this phenomenon way before Jorge. Uh, okay, in, 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 let me make a short uh, inter uh, discussion of a simplified model of a superconductor which uh, arises from repulsive interactions that was introduced by Lian Fu and uh, uh, Valentin Kreper. Um, we have collaborated with them in extending that. It's the simplest model you can think. You have electrons in a honeycomb, spinless electrons in a honeycomb lattice, the only, the simplest interaction you can cook up is a repulsive interaction between nearest neighbors. You put a strong sublattice bias and you dope it slightly away from half filling and it becomes a superconductor. And you can do it just hand waving. Uh, that was shown by uh, Valentin and Liang uh, like a year and a half ago. Uh, <clears throat> again, 
according to uh, Misha told me that some results uh, in this model were anticipated by Russian physicists before. Uh, and, and what, what uh, our contribution was to study the superconductivity of this model in a more conventional way, a la con Latinger, as uh, Andre Chukov discussed uh, extensively and clearly yesterday. And what we found is that uh, you have a kind of F wave, the, the superconductivity is a kind of F wave like, where you have valleys, uh, two different valleys. The gap parameter is more or less constant within each valley, but it has opposite signs in the two valleys. That's why it's called F wave. And it's uh, so these, these are the diagrams we calculated. The thing is that you start with an interaction between nearest neighbors, but the, 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 the diagrammatic picture outlined here creates new interactions between uh, electrons on the same sublattice, so it's, it's, it's a long range, but that interaction is attractive. And this, this attraction overcomes the repulsive interaction I, uh, you started with, and that's what leads to superconductivity. And there are similarities to, to uh, twisted by layers because in the sense you're playing with the intrinsic richness of the unit series in the model. You have two atoms in the model. You have, you're <coughs> changing the properties of those two atoms by applying a sublattice potential. And you can do it at a much larger scale in twisted by layer graphing. And we think that there are similarities, you know, there are non-negligible similarities between this model and twisted by layer graphing. Okay, one can go beyond hard tree calculations, one can do hard tree fog problem, and then one has uh, <clears throat> a, a lot of possible polarized phase or gaps phase. There are many phases um, <clears throat> which are very close in energy. This is uh, our calculation. Different polarized cases, uh, where phases differ by a few MeV per, per unit cell. But that is very consistent with the cascade Ali mentioned and with the general properties known about the insulating phases in, in graphene. Uh, let me mention here this nice uh, this animation put forward. This is an animation which shows how things change, how the bands change when you change the chemical potential. The, this is the first central band. Now the chemical potential reaches the first central band. And as uh, you will see, uh, the band shapes are changing. The, the, this is a situation where there is a gap because there is a substrate, but it doesn't matter very much. Now you get into this gap. Now, now you get to the conduction band. Uh, again, things uh, change again because you're changing the, the, the car number of carriers in the central bands. Eventually, uh, the chemical potential leaves uh, the central bands, and that's the end of it. Uh, nothing changes anymore. Everything looks like a, re a real band. <coughs> Okay, so again, this is uh, the uh, possible, uh, these hard fog results give you a possible explanation of the cascade, the number of uh, polarized phases and so on, which may be observed in, in twisted by layer graphene. So let me summarize this part of the talk by saying that relatively simple and straightforward hard fog calculations give you a lot of information about what's going on in twisted by layer graphene. So what is left is superconductivity, how similar the superconductivity in graphene is to other strongly correlated system. And let me uh, emphasize that superconductivity is very prevalent in twisted by layer graphene. Uh, and there are cases where you, you see superconducting phases, but you don't see insulating phases, while that's definitely not the case in a strongly correlated system. <clears throat> okay, so a, a possible explanation of superconductivity, which has been extensively studied, is uh, similar to the cuprase superconductivity due to uh, <clears throat> intervening uh, low energy modes associated to broken symmetry phases. <clears throat> but I will emphasize now another approach based on the con seminar con Latinger paper discussed by Andre Chuk uh, of yesterday which is, uh, as we said, one of the very early papers discussing how superconductivity can arise from repulsive interaction. <laughs> so, so superconductivity is mediated by, by electron hole pairs. We will emphasize this particular diagram out of the four diagrams considered by Korn and Latinger. The reason is that there are four types of these diagrams because there are four flavors in graphene and the others are not a general. So, so this diagram at least has, it's like the word of an expansion, you know, 
in field theory, in, in high energy, people use one over n expansions and n is the number of quarks, which is three. So n is four, so we are at the same level, let me put it that way. <laughs> and uh, as Andre said, for uh, Conan Lantinger studied the worst possible scenario for uh, Conlatinger superconductivity, uh, the electron gas in three dimensions. Uh, <laughs> And then they also mentioned, they didn't include that here, but if you include this the diagram, these charge fluctuations, you should include also longitudinal acoustic mode because longitudinal acoustic mode coupled to uh, charge fluctuation. And these are other uh, well, theory works, uh, this is by no means complete, uh, related to, to, to this topic. I will now mention what we have done. And this is another type of study due to, uh, this is, a, a, rather uh, intriguing, uh, jumps into remote bands. I will not discuss it here. But the point I want to make is that this is a kind of uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, excitations you expect in, in twisted by layer graphene. You have plasmons, you have electron hole pairs, and you have phonons, and they are all overlapping, one on top of each other. This is not what you have in a typical 2D electron gas. There, the phonons are very much decoupled from the electron hole pair because they, they basically occupy a different energy region. Um, and, and, and you can see it in this nice calculation of the dielectric function by uh, 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 Cyprian Lewandowski and Leonid Levitov. Uh, uh, you, you have uh, the continuum uh, and the plasmons close together. Uh, uh, this is our version of, of the same problem. This is with, without phonons, and this is with phonons. These uh, faint lines are the longitudinal acoustic phonons, which are coupled to, <coughs> to the electron hole continuum. <coughs> and and uh, so at the end of the day, uh, you have a kind of uh, more complicated uh, uh, response function, which includes all these electron, electron, electron hole excitation, sorry, and, and these phonons together. And you can uh, estimate what is the effect of the normalization of the phonons due to the electron hole pairs and for twisted by laser graphene is by no means negligible. So the opposite is also true. Uh, longitudinal phonons will influence the screening of the long range interaction. So this is the kind of diagrams we studied. It's very simple. It's called Latinger, linearized con Latinger. We just put uh, electrons at K and at one value and at the opposite value. We couple them via the full screen interaction, not we don't stay at second order like on Latinger. We realize that screening is very important in this uh, problem, so we'll go to infinite order. Again, I emphasize we we'll look into this diagram <clears throat> and we, we include the phonons as suggested. So this is uh, just uh, to show you the full gap equation we need to solve is by just when you do this analysis, are you using the flat band circuit? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's what I want to emphasize here. It's a, by no means a trivial calculation because the, the, the bare interaction contains a single momentum, but the screen interaction is a full matrix because you have umclap processes. You can start with Q and end with Q plus G, where G is a reciprocal Laris vector. So it's a very complex. Uh, calculation where you have to include uh, uh, form factors uh, which depend on the full wave function of the of the twisted by layer. I, yeah. I mean, I had a more primitive comment. How, how do you justify this approach when small parameter is the opposite? Could you say it again? The kinetic energy is much. I mean, <clears throat> well, you, you can do the same for the Hartley fog. We are. Well, uh, according to uh, Boris Schuller, a good theory should be valid beyond its limits of applicability. <laughs> yeah, it's getting to what Schuller calculates with a CLCP. When you calculate bubbles here, you calculate them as CLCP. I will come back to that. Uh, absolutely. It, I, the reason we stay at zero frequency is because we can't do any anything else. We're aware that it would be interesting to go beyond zero frequency. With our computer, computational means, we can't. I will tell you what limitations that in the lab. Okay. So these are results. So you do get superconductivity. You get superconductivity 
uh, comparable with critical temperatures comparable to, to the experimental ones. Also, I heard from uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, because of ones that no respectable theories should trust uh, calculations of the critical temperature, and I think they had a point. But at least the, the range is all right, the trends are all right, because you change the anger or you change the feeling, and everything goes basically with the density of state. There are similar results, but without the funnel, by right? Mike Salette at all. And they, uh, they agree, but they get a very low critical temperature. So th these are the main messages so far. Uh, <clears throat> so th this is, is the nature of the pairing interaction. We have studied it in detail. We can exclude phonons. We can uh, simplify the matrix elements. So simplify the, matrix, the, the wave functions we include. And uh, basically, both aspects are crucial. The complex matrix elements, uncraft processes, and all that. And, and 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 the phone, and these are the kind of uh, order parameter we find. The red, the black lines are the Fermi surfaces. This is a case where there are different pockets per valley. So, but the interesting thing is that we get something like in the Lian Fu Krepel model, we get an order parameter which is constant, basically constant at the Fermi surface of each valley. <coughs> Uh, these are more calculations, and these are some uh, what we have included or what we don't have included. We haven't included acoustical and optical phonons. <clears throat> they will typically increase the tendency towards pairing. However, <laughs> so depending on whether one has S wave or F wave, uh, phonons would be good. Definitely, they will increase TC for S wave pairing. And what they're doing for F wave pairing is unclear to us. We don't have, we have not considered polarized phases. Also, the method is basically the same for polarized phases. The only difference is that this factor of four in the bubbles, in the screening, you have to replace it by two. So you, I, we expect superconductivity anyway. And we don't have retardation effects. And that means that if our TC were com was comparable to the phonon frequencies, for instance, the, the, the calculation would not be reliable, but that's not the case. I mean, it is at least a factor of 10 between the TCs we have estimated and the phonon frequencies. So we can expect that in this regime of not very strongly coupled superconductivity, we have said. <coughs> and uh, as I said, we didn't study polarized phases, also in principle is something we have planned to do. And, and now let me emphasize that even the F wave superconductivity, which is likely to, to, to occur, it will so quite robust against uh, elastic scattering because only short range scattering, scattering which takes you from one valley to the other will be harmful for superconductivity. Uh, long range scattering, which is the common scattering mechanism you have in very clean graphene, uh, only couples uh, states within the same valley and uh, as the gap is more or less constant within the valley, that's okay. <coughs> uh, well, I, we have studied other situations, but I want to move fast. Uh, and they're totally different. For instance, a famous uh, case is two twisted graphene by layer. Here, you don't have these uh, flexible bands uh, I have described to you. It's the more the, the, the bands became more like rigid bands. We have not complete, you're finishing it now, the calculation for superconductivity for this case, but definitely uh, uh, the, the hard three four calculations are totally different from the hard three four calculation for single, uh, for two twisted monolayers. Uh, but I will not go into that. We have looked at twisted tri-layers where definitely the situation is very similar to a twisted bilayer, as pointed out by us in this one and collaborators. And uh, 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 we, we have superconductivity very similar to the superconductivity one has for a twisted uh, bilayer. Okay, uh, uh, this is our, our other uh, theoretical work. Some of them are actually very close to, to the one I have presented to you because based on the same diagrams. Uh, so it tends to, uh, so it reaffirms our opinion that uh, long range interactions play a crucial role in the superconductivity of twisted by layer graphene. What's this? How can I? I think you're fine. You're on. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, now uh, I will move to a non moiré system. I, I don't know how, how much time do I have left? Sorry, sorry, how much time do I have left? We have about uh, uh, seven minutes, okay. seven to ten minutes. So I will be fast. So this is a, a, a non moiré system twisted by layer, and we have looked to superconductivity in the same way. This was other calculations uh, on, on the topic. We have done this con Rattinger like calculation. Uh, these are uh, the bands. This is the kind of diagram we have. We have also included a, an inter-valley coupling uh, defined by U. And this is a kind of the effective interaction one has. And it's similar to what Andre Chubuko mentioned yesterday. It's weak, it's always repulsive, but it's weaker for small Q <coughs> than for large Q. So because of that, we do get superconductivity, but at very low energies. Uh, at sort of very low critical temperatures and with a very complex phase diagram. Notice here, this is uh, this is the order parameter, but it, it shadows uh, the Fermi surface. Notice this crossing. We only have superconductivity when the Fer uh, Fermi energy is very close to a, a, a Van Hoff singularity, which is uh, consistent with uh, the previous uh, theoretical results I mentioned to you by Andre Chubukov et al. Uh, we actually we have added electron spin orbit coupling because there's the Calte group, the uh, Stefan Aspers group. So, and, and, and amazingly, we found that the critical temperature grows with spin orbit coupling and then it saturates. Uh, so, it, it will depend on the substrate. So, but now let me move uh, quickly to the results uh, Ali has just shown about uh, Andre bus scattering uh, as measured by STM uh, probes <coughs> in uh, twisted by ledger graphene. I, 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 I miss a, a, a theory paper I mentioned by Sentil. I apologize about that. These are two recent papers. One of them was presented here last week by Lenny Glassman. Uh, okay, so what we have done is to study this type of superconductivity, this F wave superconductivity, which we think uh, phenomenologically it is not unlikely that it is the kind of superconductivity which is present in. in, in 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 twisted by layer graphene. Let me first uh, so we first study the toy model, uh, <coughs> which is just graphene plus a Haldane superconducting gap, which means that the superconducting gap has opposite signs. In, and notice that the, uh, this is these are calculations for armchair. Notice uh, these uh, edge modes. These are Majorana edge modes in 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 only in in an armchair edge, and that. Uh, December is not quite the same as what has been studied in, in this paper by uh, Payne and Mele. Uh, so the, they are protected, these uh, under F states in the middle of the gap are protected by the symmetries of the armchair edge and they are not present in the six side. Uh, if you go to a more sophisticated model of a twisted by layer graphene, you have even more uh, mid gap. More, uh, 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 mid gap and ref states, and some of them seem to cross, and they are precisely at the edges of the nano region. So, this is an equivalent calculation, but with parameters with a larger Moire unicell and so on. It's a scale Moire unicell. <laughs> and now, the last thing I want to speak is about what happens when you put a tip on this system. So, we uh, modified a little bit the model uh, outlined by Lenny Glassman or by Ali. So we have a tip, and instead of having a single uh, complex channel going out, we have two channels, one per valley. And in one valley, the, the, the gap is, the superconducting gap is positive, and the other valley, the superconducting gap is negative. And uh, let me go briefly, I'll show you what it gets. If you have uh, close contact, if you're in the BTK limit, very good contact, this is what you get. Uh, the red uh, curve is under F bus scattering. Uh, the blue line in these two graphs is a normal bus scattering. This is S wave, this is F wave, and as Ali mentioned, and, uh, and uh, Lenny uh, Glassman found, under uh, uh, F bus scattering is totally suppressed in the, in the F wave case. Uh, I have to uh, tell also that the BTK model assumes that the Fermi velocity is the same on both uh, electrodes. That's definitely not the case if you're tunneling into twisted by layer graphing because you go from a wide band to a narrow band. 
So what happens is that you suppress uh, so should I answer now or uh, yeah, you can. so I'm gonna let, let, let me finish because I'm finishing the, and, and this question is very much related to what I'm going to tell right now. So uh, what happens is that the mismatch in Fermi velocities changes a lot at red by scattering in the S wave phase. Uh, but there is something else you can do, which has also been mentioned by Ali. Uh, the tip is a short range scatterer itself. So you can mix the valleys. So you can jump from one valley to the other. And that changes a lot what happens in the S wave system. It doesn't change much what happens in the S wave case. And that makes sense. That's associated to Anderson's theorem that elastic scattering doesn't uh, screw up very much uh, uh, <coughs> the superconducting phase. But it changes a lot. And basically, what is happening is that the tip is inducing underestates states inside the gap. And these underestates states break all the symmetries. And then you can backscatter, uh, an electron can backscatter as, as a whole, even if you have a dense wave superconduct. If you are in the tunneling regime, things are similar, but you still have, I mean, this is, a, <coughs> I mean, then you, you you miss the the the, the Andre backscattering in the S wave case, <laughs> and and you also miss, you don't have also a lot of Andre scattering, but you still have a resonance due to the presence of this uh, uh, because here I have weakened the, the, as the tip is supposed to be removed from the sample, the the, the inter uh, uh, valid tunneling is weaker here, but you still have a resonance uh, in the case of F wave uh, tunneling. And you can also include uh, spin orbit coupling because that will break the equivalence between the two uh, <clears throat> the two valleys, but uh, the model allows for it. And you still have uh, a lot of structure inside the gap in the F wave case. And, and that's it. This is what I wanted to tell you. Uh, first, uh, the largest interaction is the Coulomb interaction. Then the narrow ones are very fragile. I didn't mention how strains or the substrate modifies uh, the, the narrow bands, but they also do a, a lot of damage to the bands. Uh, and then you can look at superconductivity uh, in a diagrammatic fashion mediated by electron hole pairs, plasmons, and longitudinal conons. <coughs> and and you, get super, I mean, you, you can look at uh, these uh, excitation, low energy excitations, and they can mediate superconductivity. And this is it. This is mostly the group. And this is our institution. And notice that the facade of our lab, our institution, is a perfect, it's a giant moire structure, triangular moire structure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, actually, there were a couple of questions uh, yeah. online during the talk. So I'd like to uh, read uh, two questions here. So this question is from Pierce Coleman. Mm -hmm. So yeah. in twisted ballet graphene, there is an essentially perfect value spin degeneracy. There is an additional orbital quantum number of the flat band. Okay. So we have a perfect SU4 and the imperfect SU8 symmetry. Has anyone quantified how well the one over n expansion actually works. Example, by actually calculating the diagrams that are nominally, uh, normally uh, one over n smaller. Uh, That's the question. That's a, it's a very good question. And to my knowledge, no, that has not been done. In our case, again, is for a lack of uh, computing capacity. Um, another question from online. Uh, do you expect a re-entrance of uh, the superconducting phase at high magnetic field? In uh, we haven't like... looked into that. That's a good question again. Okay. Uh, it's, in principle, that is doable within our limitations. And, uh, so I, mm -hmm. I uh, appreciate the question because we can look at it. Okay, so any questions from the audience? Uh, nice talk. I just had a question. So the diagram you showed TC as a function of doping, it, it's basically superconducting everywhere, right? Uh, not, uh, ah, not quite. We, okay. Yeah, I think it's on your last slide. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, like the f uh, probably yes, because in a mean field theory, if you, only, if you only put one possible broken symmetry state, you either find it or you don't. 
but you, you, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, this may not happen. It's like in the Hubbard model. You may have other phases which kill this superconductivity. But in principle, if those other phases are not there, you will get superconductivity. And let me mention again that if as the pairing is mediated by electron hole excitation, if you are near these other phases, but you're not quite uh, in a broken symmetry state, that will show up in the screening uh, function we are using. There will be quasi soft mode. So that is included in the calculation. What is not included is the situation where you have a real broken symmetry. Okay. Uh, just to be sure that I understood correctly, in the calculation you did of the gap using the essentially the plasmon and the phonons, the symmetry, the sign changes between different Fermi pockets. So that would be an, a gap without nodes. While the, the calculation you showed at the end to explain Andre, if assume that you have a, a gap varying inside each pocket, so nodal gaps. For the bilayer. For the bilayer, yeah. I, okay. so, so the question would be then how can you imagine that somehow this long range mediated uh, pairing can be modified to get real F wave uh, symmetry of the gap? Uh, okay, uh, that's a good question. First, our first calculations included only the long range interaction, which is intra value. And from those results, we couldn't tell whether one has S wave or F wave. It's a hint that repulsive interaction will favor F wave because there will be some Hubbard U term which uh, made it, couples the two values. And that will immediately. Uh, uh, change this degeneracy between S and F wave towards F wave. If on the other hand, what matters is a coupling via uh, optical phonons at K, for instance, then you will get the opposite. Uh, <coughs> in the case of the bilayer, we included everything, including uh, how are you for the intervalley processes. And there we didn't get exactly F wave, but something uh, similar. Uh, so, uh, I mean, within each valley, uh, within each valley, the order parameter is not constant anymore. So it's a more complex superconductivity. Super is it nodal or you still don't have nodes within each valley? Uh, it's, it's not actually. It's, uh, we, we have to work it out. It, it is shown there and it, it has a change of sign. Yeah. Uh, we didn't, I didn't show the color code, but there is a change of sign, yeah. at least one on, there may be more. Yeah, no, no, this is a very challenging calculation. Look at the scale, it's a milli Kelvin. And in addition, we have to deal with the large Brillouinson. We don't have to, to deal with a narrow, a small a Moiré Brillouinson. This is much more uh, challenging and complicated. Yeah. Any other questions? Any question from the audience? Hmm? S plus minus is not a candidate. This will be the equivalent, but it's plus in one valley and minus in the other valley, but the two valleys are, associated, are connected by a rotation. This is F wave. So this is F wave. But it is <laughs> it's the counterpart of plus minus in the nicta, I think. <laughs> The name exactly. It's an, I agree. All right. I don't see any other questions, so I let's change another question. Thank you. So, our coffee break is about 20 minutes, so we are going to come back here by.